you know, last week I told you guys, hey fam, I'm gonna make sure you get your notes, get my notes, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna wait till the following, at the end of this, uh, this time together, uh, we're gonna come together and, and pull together a, a concise list of notes for each and every one of you who signed up for it. And so I wanna make sure that you get it then, okay? Make sure you have it then. The team reminded me that was my, my fault, my mistake, but we do have your emails. And once we're done, we're gonna compile and see you a concise version of everything. So you have that going forward for your Bible study uh, journey. All right, let's get right to the word of God. And uh, I'm excited about tonight. Are y'all excited about it? I know I am. Make sure you share it. Make sure you let everybody know that the dig is on. Put it in your Facebook, put it in your Instagram, put it in TikTok, put, put it wherever. Get the link, grab it. I'm glad you subscribe. And for those who are having difficulty, let them know to go into YouTube, type in at uh, the dig dash my rock at the dig dash my rock that's the at sign the dig dash my rock all right let's pray father thank you for the opportunity to get into the word of god tonight i thank you for this uh your people and I thank you for this opportunity to dig and and uh, to look at the treasure and the gold uh, in your word i'm asking you to be with us tonight be with me as i share it in the name of jesus a to the man all right guys let's jump in I'm excited about this. I know you guys are as well. It's going to be an incredible time together. I'm just looking for um, my round of applause and all that good stuff. And I'm going to need some help with that real quick. And um, well, let's jump right on in. Here we go. We're going to kind of, I'm not going to recap too much. Come on. I'm not going to recap too much. And uh, I don't want to say a whole lot about what happened last week too much because I want to make sure we spend ample amount of time on this particular week. And so as much as I'm excited about going back over that, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 very quickly. All right, let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm not going to read that right away. I want to give you some stuff to, to think about very quickly, okay? All right, so we picked up last week, we talked about, you know, the wealth in a Corinth. We talked about Corinth being the hub of commerce. We talked about them being uh, similar to a modern day New York. We talked about the style of clothing that they wore, the dress. We talked about the opulence, the decadence. We talked about the paganism and their ideas of philosophy as it pertains to politics and things of that nature, but especially more importantly, their idea of deity and worship and sex and religion, all of the above, we walked through with Corinthians and we realized that this was a very difficult space for Paul to track through for the gospel. Uh, incredible region, incredible resources, incredible uh, resources, gifted, giftedness, giftedness in the people, uh, wisdom, education, politics, influence, power, all of the above. However, it's a culture that needed to be tamed into the culture of righteousness, which is the culture of the kingdom of God. So Paul's preaching this gospel that they've never heard before. He's preaching a message of salvation that you can be saved, not through your wisdom, not through what you own and possess, but you can be saved through faith in the man, Jesus Christ. And this gospel is one that is met with a level of resistance, but at the same time, uh, because of the mixture of the culture, it was difficult to uh, to get to a place where you can cause people to come into agreement with what God was asking them to do. They were so infused with the uh, cultural worship, idea, idolatry, um, sexual promiscuity, uh, using sex as literally an idea, a symbol of worship. Uh, we're talking about Aphrodite. We talked about the, uh, the prostitutes and things of that nature. So there was a whole lot going on in Corinth. And so I want to kind of pick up where we left off and not really go back over too much, but I want to pick up where we left off and kind of walk through this idea of when Paul begins to write this letter and why. You ready? Let's go. So Paul first visited Corinth around uh, 49 AD. This is 49 years after the death of the crucifixion of Christ. And this is his second missionary journey to that area okay so he lived here in this time with priscilla and aquila now we talked about them 
as well. But one thing you probably didn't know about Priscilla and Aquila that you can find in Acts chapter 18, verse 1 through 18, is that they were tent makers just like Paul. As a matter of fact, I believe they trained Paul into their tent making uh, their tent making occupation. So Paul had a level of skill sets we can tell, but based upon being able to work with tents, we could tell he was a man for the outdoors. We could tell that he was not accustomed to, I mean, he was not, it was not lost on him to be accustomed to working with his hands and the things of that nature. So we know that Paul had a level of skill set outside of just preaching and teaching and the scholarly understanding of the Judaic, uh, Judaic law, uh, of the Jewish law. But we also see that he was good with his hands. And so Paul is a tent maker with Priscilla and Aquila. They did this by trade. They did not solely live off the gospel, but these men and women at this time, as they're preparing to preach this new message, right? This message of the way, this message of the kingdom, this message of Jesus, which is now at this point, almost 50 years old. So imagine preaching and teaching a belief system that's only 50 years old. So it's still very young as, a, as it pertains to religion. So people mocked it. People talked about it. And we're talking about it took great courage and great faith in that hour to believe something about a God 50 years old to believe something about a religion that's only 50 years old 50 years old and so now uh at during this first phase of paul's ministry in corinth uh his first part of his journey was to the jews paul spent the first part of this missionary journey in acts chapter one i checked it Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 18, I, I, I misspoke. Acts chapter 18, verse 1 through 18, we see that Paul's beginning of his missionary journey is really heavily involved and entrusted into the into the Jews. He is preaching the gospel to the Jews that are in this Greek area. So I know oftentimes we like to say that Paul never preached to the Jews. Paul was a, his gospel was to the Gentiles. And for the most part it was, but in order for him to have freedom to preach in this area, it was important that he went to the synagogues to also uh, preach this gospel to the Jews, those who are uh, those who are of the faith of Yahweh, but not necessarily believing that the Meshach or the Messiah had yet come. So he wants to preach to them because if he can win them, it would make the message of the gospel easier to be preached throughout this Gentile region. Now watch this, because he's not just preaching to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he's preaching them, uh, pre preaching to them not the gospel that Peter preached, that their salvation is theirs, but the gospel that Paul is preaching says that others can be included as well. Now this is a tense, tense message to be preaching, especially to, at the time, Orthodox Jews about a new religion that's 50 years old. Now track with me for a little bit longer. Uh, so now Paul's in this missionary journey. This is his first trip there. He's preaching to the Jews and he's also preaching to Gentiles who feared God. Now there's two categories that are being impacted positively by Paul's first missionary journey to Corinthians. And we see it in Acts chapter 18. First it's the Jews. Number two, it's Gentiles or there are Gentiles who feared God. So people who had heard the message or actually had faith in a higher power, but you know, those who feared God, he preached a message of hope and faith and trust through Jesus Christ to them as well. All right. And so now because of that, he's opposed by the Jews in the synagogue as we read in Acts chapter 18, and he is expelled. And remember, there was fights in that synagogue. They were fighting. They were judged by Galileo. We talked about that last week. And so now these individuals, the, the, I want you to imagine this with me, the intensity, the tense nature of this time, the, 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 the warfare that Paul is walking through and, uh, and dealing with in his body, in his person, in his mental state, etc. And so now they're being expelled from this area. However, Titus or Titius, Justus and Crispus, uh, who is the ruler of the synagogue at that time, he actually believed the message. So because Paul preached this message positively, uh, passionately, with great uh, conviction about it, even some of the most, uh, albeit the most uh, significant persons within the synagogue, especially that being the, the seat of the ruler of the synagogue, they believe this message that Paul was preaching in Acts chapter 18. And because they believed on it, it did make it a little bit easier for them to build in that region. Just a little bit because people who were of status in the Jewish culture now started to believe. Even though they got expelled, 
Even though they got whooped, they were starting to believe. I'm not going to add too much on my own commentary, but that's the gospel, right? The gospel is there are those who don't believe, but there may be one that will. That, you know, every time we throw something out there to minister, to encourage, everybody won't accept it. Perhaps somebody will. So let's look at that real quick in Acts chapter 18, verse 8. Acts chapter 18, verse 8. I'm going to pull that up for you, and I'm going to share my screen. Acts chapter 18. Verse 8. Let's look at that together. Acts chapter 18. Let's go there. Acts 18. Verse 8, I believe. It says that, uh, let's look at verse 7. Right here. Let's look at verse 7 together. I'm going to highlight that for you guys. You got it? Okay. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named, uh uh-oh, went to the house of a man named, Tidious Justice, a worshiper of God. So we talked about those individuals a moment ago. He was a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household. That means everything that he had, his family could have been in-laws, could have been servants, whatever, uh, with his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. I'll say it again. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household and many of the Corinthians when they heard uh, when they heard were believing and being baptized and many of the Corinthians when they heard were being believing were believing and being baptized all right so the first church meeting of Corinth was actually held watch this at Tidius Justice house you can find this in Acts chapter 18. So they're telling us or showing us through history, they believe that the first meeting. So Corinthian existed on what we call house churches, small groups, life groups, etc. Small groups is a biblical precedent. We see that in Acts chapter two. As a matter of fact, they would go from house to house and they would break bread and fellowship and continue in the apostles doctrine in Acts chapter two. But what we're looking at throughout the context of church building and church planting was houses or small church houses. So the first church house or the first house to house Paul's ministry was Titius Justice. He was also known as Gaius in scripture, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Guys, and we'll get to that in a minute. Matter of fact, let's go there now. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. I'll share that with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll go there, 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 14. I think they're there. I believe we're here. Make sure my volume's good. All right. There we go. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Gaius is who we just mentioned ago. In a, a second ago, we just mentioned him a few seconds ago. And uh, Gaius, who is really Titius Justice, who's also known as Gaius. So Paul mentions him in the letter in 1 Corinthians chapter chapter 1, verse 14. He says, thank God I didn't baptize none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did, bat- now I did baptize also the house of Stephanus beyond that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Paul mentions him by name in verse 14 of chapter one. Now notice it's a bit laborious here, but we're about to work in a second. All right. So let's go back to our notes. The second phase of Paul's ministry is where it gets interesting. So the first phase of Paul's missionary journey, again, is to the Jews and to Gentiles who fear God. The second phase is not to the Jews. Now, we don't have any recording that said he did not mention the gospel or preach the gospel to any Jews, but that was not the intent and the purpose of his second missionary journey to Corinth. His second missionary journey to Corinth was dedicated solely to the Gentiles, dedicated solely to the Gentiles. So the Lord spoke to him in a vision, according to the scriptures, and encouraged him to keep preaching. In Corinth, and this is what we found in Acts chapter 18. We just read it a moment ago when he told him, he spoke to him in vision, verse 9 and 10. Acts chapter 18, 
verse 9 and 10, God told him to stay in Corinth. Nobody's going to harm you. So he did in fact stay. He stayed in a total of 18 more months. And because of his efforts, Paul now founded, if you will, for lack of a better phrase, or organized the church in Corinth. All right. So within that time space of those 18 months of him organizing out of Titius Justice House and others, Paul now has been preaching. And because of the influence of justice and others and other uh, Greek men and women who lived in Corinth, the church became known for notable leadership. In other words, they were known for having notable people of influence in their particular church. It would be the it would be similar to saying, you know, hey, uh, we have a lot of influencers at The Rock or we have, um, you know, a lot of people who have a lot of followers online and things of a nature. Or we have mayors, we have lawyers, we have doctors, we have uh, city lyrics, uh, city leaders, civic leaders. Uh, the mayor attends our church, the school board president attends our church. In other words, those are men and women of notable, uh, notable name and status in the community. The church of Corinth in its beginning, in its infancy through Paul's labor of 18 months, now they have accumulated men and women of means and of influence in the culture in this particular church. So this church of Corinth was a powerful church as it pertains to resources and notable personalities within their church. Now, that's an interesting thing to know. I'll give an example. Some of the people that were notable was Chloe, Aristus, Tertius, and Stephanus. I'll give you that later on. After Paul left Corinth now, he now starts writing letters to the church that he founded. And the first letter he wrote, now watch this, is not in fact 1 Corinthians. Pause. That's a bombshell for a lot of you because you're thinking like the Bible is completely, has everything in it, nothing's missing. And I believe that nothing is missing. But I want to tell you, the first letter that Paul wrote the church of Corinth is not 1 Corinthians. That's the first letter we have. The first letter that he wrote to Corinthians is lost. We cannot find that letter. The only reason why we know that that letter exists is because Paul mentions that letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. I'll read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. My misspoke. Verse 9. And I'll just go there real quick for you, and I'll let you see that. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 9. I'll go there show my screen real quick. You guys got it? Everybody's tracking with me? And I'll highlight it for you. We're reading in the New American Standard. That's what I have already listed for you guys. He says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not all mean, I did not at all mean with the moral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person, covetous or an idolater, reveler, drunk or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. He mentions this in verse nine that he wrote a letter, which gives theologians the idea, well, and actually the truth, that Paul wrote other letters to the church of Corinth. But this particular letter was one that uh, we do not have copies of. So after he wrote this first letter to Corinth, they read that in their house churches. Because in that time, when you receive the letter from your leader, from your pastor, from your founder, etc., whatever, when you receive that letter, you read that letter in a small group. You let everybody know, hey, we got a letter from Paul. Actually, they would call him Paulos, Paulos. We have a record. We got a letter from Paulos. Paulos has wrote us. Paulos has written us a letter. And they would be excited and they would read this letter in their small church hub. Now watch this. They would share that letter or at least a representative would carry that letter. To whom that letter was inscribed, that person would carry that letter from house church to house church until the whole of the people of God got a chance to hear what Paulos or whoever the person that wrote the letter was saying to their church. Now it gets very interesting because around this time, Paul's like, okay, I sent the first letter, whatever. 
Now he's gotten feedback. According to history and according to Paul's letter of uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, the Bible says that Paul wrote and said, hey, I got a report from Chloe's household at Corinth where he said, I heard there's some, there's some factions and some uh, friction and some quarreling happening in my church. Now, let's go there so you don't think I'm adding to the text and making stuff up. Let me show you for yourself. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. Let's go there. I'll share my screen yet again. Verse 11. For I have been informed concerning you, brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Let me highlight that. Let me highlight that. And then let's look at what they was arguing about. He says, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? He goes on and argues that whole idea. But I want to show you that he got news that something was going on because he has spoke to somebody from Chloe's house. Now that's important. So before Paul writes 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he finds out that there's a quarrel and there are fights, there are factions, which triggered him to write the whole of 1 Corinthians. Now let's get busy. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Put that in the chat for me. Let's get busy. Let's get busy. Let's get busy. I gave you a brief introduction. Now it's time to do some labor. Let's clap it up. Thank you very much. All right. So we're going to jump right into it. Who is Chloe? Who would have that kind of significance that somebody in their home would be able to get to Paul? Literally, how would that happen? If the church is meeting at Titus' house and Chloe's house, who, how, how did they get to Paul? Well, Chloe must be somebody. Chloe was a homeowner at that time. One of the house, she actually uh, owned one of the houses that the churches were meeting in or that the Corinthian church was meeting in. She was a friend of Paul, some would say, and he referred to her by first name. Now, that was interesting to refer to her by first name, Chloe, that if he can say her name, Chloe, it's like saying, uh, I want to use the right name, LeBron. LeBron is a name, right? Right? LeBron is a name. If you say, you know, Jordan, Jordan's a name, right? Chloe had a name in that, in that community. Chloe was a landowner. Chloe was a homeowner. Chloe was a female. Chloe had clout. Chloe had money. Chloe had influence. She was one of the notable personalities that heard the gospel and believed. Chloe had servants and Chloe had slaves. Chloe had what they called at that time a household. And trust me, this is very interesting because theology, or should I say um, theology proper, teaches us that Chloe's household, her slaves or her servants were the ones, not Chloe herself, that went back to Paul complaining about the fighting in the church. I want to pause there for a moment and really explore that with our theological imagination, if we could do that within the context and the framework of which I have time, and I do got a little time. The slaves went back and told that something was not right with the leadership. The slaves, the slaves, and not just the leadership, but just with the brothers and sisters. There are people who are slaves and servants who were trying to live for Jesus or trying to learn this gospel that felt like something is happening. Uh, our brothers and sisters are fighting each other, and Paul has to settle this because we don't have enough Bible or enough conviction or enough understanding, enough revelation, enough information about the gospel to do it ourselves. And so, in fact, they wrote to Paul and Paul said, wow, if the slaves are talking to me, I got to address them. So Paul receives this letter and starts pinning. He starts pinning. But while he's pinning, he receives another letter. This time it's not from Chloe's household, but it's from some of the other members of other churches, other house churches. And they're like, yo, we got a lot of questions about marriage and divorce because we wilding over here. We got questions about weak brothers and weak sisters. 
benefit. Uh -huh. We got questions about these spiritual gifts. I'm going to get to that. We got questions about how to collect money, collections. And as a report, Paul figured, I'm going to answer these questions and I'm going to pin this letter. So he combines his, his, his letter. He continues that letter by adding um, uh, answers to the other questions that other churches within Corinth or the house churches were sending him letters about. He does this around A.D. 55. This is five years from the time he began his work in Corinth. He writes this letter, not from Corinth. He writes this letter while he's on another missionary trip in Ephesus, preaching the gospel in Ephesus, which later became the church of Ephesians. Y'all, come on now. I'm working. I'm working. All right. Let's jump into the introduction of chapter one. Y'all ready? All right, so Paul begins this letter in the customary fashion. Uh, if you look at Paul's letters, Paul starts off by saying, I, Apostle Paul, you can see that in Galatian, or he's going to tell you, I wrote this letter. This letter is coming from myself. And he identifies himself along with this guy named, I can't pronounce it, Sothenes, I think it's Sothenes, something like that, but we're going to call him Sos. And so <laughs> he writes a letter. Uh, and 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 Sos is the person that he writes the letter for. In other words, I want you to be the carrier of this particular grace and things of that nature, whatever. And so he's the recipient. The recipients of this, the ones who are going to actually know this letters for them specifically, is the entirety of the whole of a church of God in Corinth. And so the letter was addressed to all of those everywhere who are call who call Jesus their Lord, and who will call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And so the greeting is a traditional Pauline salutation. Hello, I'm, I'm Paul. He gives you a, a lengthy expression of thanksgiving about how he prays for you and all that good stuff. That's what Paul does. And Paul starts it off in verse one. Now I'm going to put this up on the screen for a while. So just bear with me. I'm going to give you my screen and I want you to see it. And we're going to start at verse one very quickly. I'm going to blow it up just a little bit. There it is. This is for those who are watching on their cell phone and for those who are watching on their TV. All right. Hopefully it's a side by side right now of myself and the screen. Is that correct? All right. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He starts off by the will of God. First thing he says, Paul. We know it in, in, uh, in the uh, Greek. It's Paulos. Paulos. Say that with me while you're at home real quick. Paulos. I need everybody to say that with me. I know you sit on the couch like I ain't saying that. Say that. Paulos. Paulos. So the long word, uh, the first uh, word that he opens up with is his name. It's his Jewish name. Right? Well, this is the Greek's name, but the Jewish name is Saul. But he changed his name to, to, um, to, to Paul. Okay? Interesting to note, though, and I learned this today. You ready? This is powerful. That Paul is the only apostle who's called by the resurrected Christ or the resurrected Jesus. That pre-resurrection, Jesus called 12. One betrayed, we know him as Judas, they cast lots for his place. The lot fell on Matthias, he became the 12. But Paul is the only one called after the resurrection. Isn't that interesting? And his calling was different than the others. Because Paul received his call, according to Galatians chapter 1, not by flesh and blood. He received it by Christ himself. He did not consult with men about his being called. Uh, he knew what he was. He went straightway to Arabia. He worked out his message uh, in Arabia. He didn't consult with flesh and blood. He worked out his message. When they heard his message, they approved. You, in fact, have heard from the Lord. You are definitely called to this seat. But uh, it's interesting how he is the first one to be called of God. Uh, having um, uh, being called by the resurrected Christ. And this kind of speaks because when you think about Paul's life, the life he had lived as Saul, who was persecuting the Jews, persecuting people in the way, Christians, persecuting believers, separating families, making folk widows, etc., jailing Christians, uh, being in charge and responsible for them being stoned and hung and all that type of stuff burned at the stake because Paul was a part of these particular persecutions against the Lord's church. I find it interesting that in the beginning of the new covenant, after the death of Christ, how he as slanderous as he was wicked as he was 
would be brought in by a resurrected Christ. Isn't that powerful? That in this dispensation, this covenant that we're in, the resurrected Christ calls people who are broken, who are damaged, who are ups, who are who are uh, 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 mistake prone, who are fallen, who are in complete debauchery and chaos, and He'll call you, transform you, and then reposition you or repurpose you for the original intent of the gospel. Isn't that profound? Anyway, profound to me. So he is chosen. He says, Paulos, I am the one who is chosen. I'm the one who was called, Paul says in verse, verse two. He says that he is called. That word called there, chosen, is the word in Greek, kletos. So what he says in Greek is Paulos kletos, right? Which means I have a divine mandate. When you see the Greek word chosen or called in the New Testament, especially if it's the Greek word kletos, it literally means I have an assignment akin to those who were called in the old covenant meaning the prophets or even uh, early church, uh, not church, but early uh, biblical characters like Moses and, 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 and David and, and um, even Abraham, right? And so he says, I have a divine call. I have a kletos on me. I have a divine mandate that like that of an Old Testament prophet like Jeremiah or like Isaiah. So he says, also, I'm called to be an apostle. That Greek word is the word apostolos, right? It means one who is sent, a messenger or an ambassador, one who is sent out, a sent one. Say that with me, a sent one. Say this with me, an apostolos or an apostle is a sent one. Put in the chat, a sent one. That's the apostolos. I am sent to a specific region with a specific responsibility. I am a sent one. No one is called to be the apostle of the nation. Mm -hmm. you're sent to your region, you're sent to your area and you're sent or to whatever that area. Now that area may geographically expand, but you're sent to a locale. You're sent to a region. Praise God. And so thank God we're sent, right? So let me go back to you. Give this, go back and, and, and read this to you again. In Greek, he says, Paul, Kletos, Apostolos. Those first three words in Greek are powerful. Paulos, Kletos Apostolos, which literally means that I am a sent one called by God, called by God for the purpose of a particular assignment in a particular region. And the region he's talking about that he has governance in is Corinth. Now, let's work. Let's work. He says he's called of Jesus Christ in chapter one. He's called of Jesus Christ, the one who makes us holy. He talks about grace and peace to you and a salutation. But Paul starts digging in really solid. And he starts digging in around chapter one, verses 10 through 17. Work with me. Stay there with me. Paul's first major topic that he wanted to address after he let them know, I am the apostle and I am a sent one to this region. Now I need to address some of the rumors that came out of Chloe's household to my ears via letter. The first thing he wants to address are the levels of division in the church. The problem with men and women being divided and not just being divided because of doctrine, but being divided based upon who they claim that they follow. Some said, I follow Paul, Apollos, Cephas, which is Peter, or others who tried to be really spiritual and say, I follow Jesus Christ. <laughs> so the leaders of these churches, that means the leader at Chloe's church, Justice Church and others, Gaius' church, those people are now fighting over who they follow because they're not cemented in the foundations of Christ yet. I'm going to get there. So most likely, most of the people that are leading out are what we consider super spiritualists. And so these people are really at the next level and really deep with their understanding. So Paul gets frustrated and he makes an appeal to them at verse 10. Let's look at verse 10 together. You see that? He says, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now, I mean this, that I, it, each one of you is saying, I'm a Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I have Christ. Christ. Has Christ been divided? He asked the question. Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius. That's where it started. So that none would say they've been baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, hear this, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Let me argue this for a quick second. He says, I appeal to you. We see um, in the New American Standard, he uses the phrase, that I exhort you. But the phrase is, I appeal. It's the Greek, parakaleo, which means I call out to you. Um, there's a parakaleo theo. We see the same phrasing uh, in the book of Acts, help me, Lord, where in the, the demon is, is, uh, whooping people and, and the sons of Sceva, uh, the, the priest of the sons of Sceva, he says, um, um, you know, I cast you out in the name of Jesus, whom Paul is preaching. And the demon is like, well, Paul, I, I know Paul, I know Jesus, I know which is part of that appeal. Jesus has appealed to me. It means um, I'm convinced about him. That's what that meant. He said, but who are you? So Paul, I know, meaning I'm acquainted with it's two different Greek words. Jesus, I know that word meant that I'm convinced about you. It's the same root system of, of this appealing here, but who are you, right? So this is the same way I appeal to you and the authority to live harmony with no divisions. That word divisions there is the word schismata where we get our english word schisms from it little isms and schisms we talk about that we joke but that's actually a word and it demonstrated the word was used in hellenistic times to denote the struggle that roman political groups engaged in power herein they principally align themselves with individual leaders rather than party designations so he uses a phrase because this is what they were doing they were invoking worldly arguments hear me the way the world argues into the church context. So this is instant, this is this is critical here because Paul is saying y'all are fighting, having arguments, trying to say how much Peter is better than Paul and how much Paul is better than this person and how much Jesus is better than them all. They're fighting, having spirited, argumentative, schismata, divisions, arguments, like political, um, like Republicans versus Democrats versus independents, literally fighting about their viewpoints, fighting, arguing over people who led them to the faith about who is more important and proving their spiritual piety by who they're connected to. Y'all, that is crazy. But we do that in today's culture. These are the members of the household of, of, of Chloe who shared that. Let me keep moving because we don't have a lot of time. And I want to, was it 812? I want to make sure we jump into this. So Paul argues this and Paul begins to move a little bit further. And Paul says, well, the reason why they're fighting like this, to be honest with you, is uh, because they're infants in Christ. So in verse 18, he kind of begins this new conversation where he unpacks their infancy. And he does this between 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. So he spends quite a bit of time now saying, in this letter, I got to let them know that the reason why they're tripping anyway is because they are a bunch of babies. They're infants in Christ. They don't know any better. And I'm going to show them that though they think they are wise, uh oh, come on here, though they think they are mighty, Though they think they have all knowledge, they don't have nothing when it comes to the measurement of who you are in Christ. Y'all are babies and he works them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll go there. Paul begins uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 by picking up a train of thought where he left off uh, in the middle of chapter 1. Let's look at it. He says, and when I came to you, brethren, verse 1 I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. They were used to that. They were used 
to him having arguments or not Paul, but others having arguments to counter uh uh, to 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 counter their belief systems right not convince me about this in my head not in my heart they they were a people of knowledge they were people of means and understanding and so he says i didn't come to you trying to persuade you with words of wisdom but i came in demonstration of the power and of spirit let me see if i can work this we traditionally think that the spirit uh well those of us who are pentecostal we think that it was just in demonstration of of activity of laying hands on the sick and all that kind of stuff but we don't have a lot of biblical proof that paul went there and did that we know he did but we don't have a lot of writing that says that that's what's happened so when paul's talking about the spirit and the power oh, he's not necessarily talking about the casting out of devils. I know we like to say that, and I'm not saying that's not, you can't use that there, so you can continue using it. But what I am saying responsibly within context, he's talking about giving the spirit of God, help me Jesus, the room to convict and correct itself. The difference between me arguing about who Jesus is, apologio, having these arguments with you, or arguing our faith or apologetically explaining why I believe what I believe so passionately is because I can say it and the Holy Spirit will back it in your heart. He'll back me by ministering to your heart. You see what I'm saying? That when you hear false doctrine or false thinking, that was what you believed in your head. But when you hear the truth of the gospel, it deals with your spirit. What we teach and preach does not have anything to do with your head. It has everything to do with your belly. It bypasses the head, curves to the belly. That's what it does. It navigates around the head, straight to the belly. Paul said, I did not come to persuade. Hallelujah. Hey, hey, I did. Sorry. Uh-uh. I did not come to persuade you with my intellectual prowess. I didn't come to give you seminary or cemetery. I came to give you the truth and that truth will navigate itself in power and demonstration. And you will bear fruit after you hear truth when you say yes to truth. Just do me a favor. Just say yes right where you are. This is not supposed to be that, but just say yes right where you are. Yeah, with truth, with truth. He says, uh, so that your faith, come on, would not rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. In other words, you felt that truth hit you. That truth, that truth changed you. You felt it. He says, yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, a, uh, 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 who, are, who are mature a wisdom. However, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's a bar. That's a whole bar. Paul saying, if the people in this world really knew, if they really caught it, what was about to happen, the systems that are under demonic control, etc., they would have pumped the brakes on trying to crucify Jesus. They would have stopped that whole thing from happening. But because this wisdom is not earthly, whoo, Paul better, <laughs> y'all, Paul, Paul, y'all, where, where's my joint at? Where is my joint at? Paul, Paul just dropped a whole, a whole bomb. Here it is. This is this. Paul, I'm gonna read that again. Paul says, We don't speak the wisdom in the mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Mm -mm. He said, the wisdom which none of the rulers of his age had understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified Jesus. Y'all, that's a bar. <laughs> that's a whole bar from Paul. Paul just smashed that. He said, Y'all are so y'all are so smart. You're dumb. So God had to say things in a mystery. We're preaching a thing that you can't even understand. And when it happened and manifested, salvation now comes to everybody beyond your head. Man could not architect, architect a, a plan of salvation. Y'all, let me do this alone. Mm -mm, mm -mm. What Jesus says, not my time yet. I'm not supposed to be preaching. I'm supposed to be teaching. All right. So Paul is lighting them up now. Paul is having the blast. 
He's like, I think, I think the fire of God's coming in his belly. He comes back to the idea now, and Paul reminds the Christians of Corinthians. Uh, Corinth, he tells them, hey, man, listen, when I first came to y'all, I started preaching the gospel. I need you to remember that I came with that purpose and with that understanding. Now, the Corinthian church showed a great misunderstanding of the essential truth of the gospel. The Corinthians now evidenced a wrong concept of wisdom, a wrong concept of the gospel, and a wrong concept of spirituality. They had a wrong concept of wisdom. They had a false concept of the gospel, and they had a false concept <clears throat> of spirituality. And this is why <clears throat> they would use their wisdom or try to argue how Cephas was better than this. And Paul saying that your wisdom is infantile. You demonstrated that all of y'all are really babies. You really don't know anything as it pertains to the wisdom of God, which is a mystery to men. Let's keep working. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, hey, y'all, I love y'all, this and this and this. Now let's work. Hey, why are we having divisions amongst us? Jesus Christ died for us all. None of us died for any of y'all. Stop arguing about who's brighter, who's this, who's that, and I'm of this, I'm of that. Forget the defense, the, the dissensions within the church. Chapter 2, he comes in a little bit stronger, starts arguing how God's wisdom surpasses all their wisdom. It's a continuum of where he left off in chapter 1. He argues that throughout chapter 2. Chapter 3, though, now he starts talking about, hey, we got to partner with the work of God. We got to partner with the furtherance of the kingdom being advanced in Corinth. So Paul and Apollos, he says, we're not in competition with each other. Now, let me go back just for a little bit, because when you think about those who are arguing about Apollos, it's important that I tell you um, in, in chapter two a little bit about that. And I wrote a little note here. I want to read it to you about that, because Apollos was definitely Paul's guy, right? He was somebody he was working with, with, with Apollos. But Apollos was known for being very well uh, redacted in his speech. He, he could communicate, he could talk. Uh, and so there were those who were trying to pin him against Paul because though Paul was educated and Paul was smart, I don't know if Paul had the same, um, uh, command of the vernacular, the same. I think he was an intelligent man, but I think a little rough around the edges, right? Maybe, I don't know. But, but Apollos was an astute man. He was, he was very, uh, eloquent of speech and, and, and so there were those who tried that. And I felt that it's necessary to, to bring that up, bring that up. Okay. All right. So verse, chapter, back, going back to chapter three, my apologies. So Paul and Apollos were not in competition with each other. And Paul has to tell them, Hey, Paul's my guy. We ain't, and then he, he argues, we're nobody. You can look at that at chapter three, verse five. Right, chapter three. Let's look at chapter three, verse five. He says, uh, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? It's all a part of the same conversation that began in chapter one. He says, servants to whom you believe. Let me ar argue it again. What, what is Apollos? What is Paul? Like, what are we? We're servants to whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God is causing the increase. Or God is causing the growth. So then neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his labor, his own labor. You get it? According to his own labor. So Paul spending some time saying, hey, me and Apollos, we're not beefing with each other. That's my guy. I plant, I plant it. Now let me argue here. That phrase planted, we can argue that that speaks to Paul's labor to found, or should I say, organize this particular church. I planted Apollos in my absence, along with others. He's watering. He's teaching you to walk in the discipline and the instruction of the apostles doctrine. But God's the one that's increasing the church, not his teaching, not my founding. Are y'all here? This is context of the scripture. You can still say it, but I'm giving you context. So there were partners in the work of God. One planted, the other one watered. One did his part, but God's the one who ultimately brings the growth. Okay, let me read that to you in the New Living Translation. I want to read verse 8. It says, the one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose. 
and both will be rewarded for their own work. For we are both God's workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. So now Paul says, all right, now that we've got that clear, I need to go back to something that y'all don't know. And that is the fact that, or you act like you don't know, that, <laughs> that is the clear reality that Jesus, Jesus is the foundation. Let me share my screen once again so we can see this together. He's telling them, Jesus, he's the foundation, y'all. Nobody else is Jesus. I'll highlight that for you real quick. Let's read together. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a, a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another's building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on this foundation. For no man, hey, 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 can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show uh, it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself, watch this, will test the quality of each man's work. Now, when we read this, oh, Lord Jesus, we automatically assume that this is talking about when we get to heaven. It's quiet now. You hear that? I need to wake him up. So I wake him up. Try it again. Wake him up. Wake him up. Wake up, y'all. All right. We automatically read this. Oh, my God. We, oh, my God. <sighs> we automatically read the scripture. And we're like, each man work going to be tried. And we, <laughs> I'm not saying that God's not going to try it. I'm just going to say in context, that's not what it's saying. Mm -mm, it's not what it's saying. No. What he's saying is <laughs> each man's work will be evident for the day will show it will be, it will show it for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself would test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which is built on remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. <sighs> so let me see if I can make this modern. That all of our works experience fire. Mm-hmm. Whatever you're planting, building, whatever you're doing, especially in church planting, church building, is going to go through the fire. Financial fire, fire within the congregation, divisions, and we'll see what you built on that foundation based upon what lasts. If it fizzles out, you will be saved. Hmm. But it didn't stand the test of the fire. Hey, hey, every ministry is going to go through fire. This is not talking about heaven. I just want to be clear. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's keep moving. <laughs> he says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? And if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. So on and so forth. This is all in chapter three. And let me go back to my notes. Let's pull this up. So the foundation of the church was not the leaders, but Jesus. Say this with me and put this in the chat. Uh-oh, we're almost out of time. Jesus is the foundation of the church. Jesus is the brand of the church. Hey, Jesus is the brand. The brand is Jesus. Jesus is the brand. The brand is Jesus. Jesus is the brand. The brand is Jesus. That's it. That's it. And each person builds on the foundation of Christ. And what is built may be something valuable or something worthless. All right? All right. All right. Let's see. Paul goes on talking about that. Christ being the foundation of all that we build. In verse 10, he talks about the grace has given us to be master, uh, be master builders and etc. So on and so forth. Matter of fact, around verse 21, he says, so don't boast about following a particular human leader. He concludes the argument he started in, in verse chapter 1. Matter of fact, let's read it. 20, let's read it together. Verse 21. I got to rush on to my clothes. Look what it says here. Paul says, y'all. He tells them. He said, look here, guys. Let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. 
whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas of the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you. And you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Y'all don't argue about that dumb stuff. Don't argue about this and that. He said it all belongs to you and all of it belongs to Christ and all Christ belongs to God. You got it? All right. Is this good so far? Are y'all catching us today? Are y'all encouraged? All right. So he moves to chapter four. Now, again, I want to argue this. Um, theologians, we uh, well, those who canonize and those who put the scriptures together, they broke these into chapter one, two, three, four. As a matter of fact, I don't know when that happened. Um, I need to find it out so I can have that for you. But I do know that early scripture writings, and especially the Greek Septuagint, there was no chapters. You're just reading. You're just reading. You know what I mean? So they broke it up. So for those of us, especially in the West and even parts of the East, uh, it can make sense and have a level of continuity so you can understand and phrases and breaks and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they broke the letters up for us to make it make more sense. And then they uh, begin to uh, give subtitles to each one so you can help understand what you're reading. So chapter four, we're going to try to get the chapter. The goal is to get to chapter eight. Um, if I can keep moving, put in the chat, keep moving and I'll keep moving. And I'm going to wrap it up fast. Chapter four is interesting, though, because now chapter four, Paul starts to deal with human leaders. He starts to deal with with Christian leaders and things of that nature. So he warns them, do not be mean human leaders. And uh, and he talks about um, uh, uh, Christian leaders. And, and Paul begins in chapter four uh, of chapter four, verse one through five. He wants to argue that the Corinthians must not be puffed up to themselves in the position of judging one another, uh, judging of one of their ministers against another. In other words, he's still arguing a little bit about comparing preachers or comparing who's ministering to them with another person who's ministering to them and making ministers feel a certain kind of way and making divisions and factions within the congregation about who's better, who's a better communicator and things of that nature. He's really like, you shouldn't be puffed up about that stuff. This is found in 1 Corinthians. He spends his time there. And Paul strongly affirms the principle that God's written word and not our human tradition or opinion is the ultimate arbiter of our faith. And that when personal opinion is elevated to the same status as God's word, bickering and division will result. And Paul says that believers are to be far from perfect themselves. Not, I'm sorry, not to be, but believers are far from perfect themselves. And that the good is in their lives that have been received from God as a gift. And why would you boast about something that you got freely as a gift? And you can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. That kind of gives you to understand. So Paul uses a lot of sarcasm here. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. Let's look at it. Paul uses a lot of sarcasm. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, you are already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. For I think God has exhibited us as apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death. Because we have, a, we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you're strong. You are distinguished. We are without honor. Woo! Man, y'all, do y'all hear what Paul is doing? Paul is dismantling the arrogance and the puffed up nature by putting a stark contrast between what a leader should be amongst people to be the leader. He said, hey, you are kings. I'm so glad you're kings. We get the reign with you. We're apostles, though. We're apostles. Last of all. We're last of all. He exhibited us as apostles last of all. We're condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. Mm -hmm. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, he says, verse 11, we are both hungry and thirsty and poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless, and we toil, working with thy hands. We are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. 
I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were, if you have to have, if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me, which means chop away at your puffiness. Yeah, you got stuff, but man, be sold out for Christ. Y'all got it? Y'all got it? All right. That's chapter four. I'm going to rush on, rush on to my close. Uh, he gets to 1 Corinthians chapter five. And this is where it really gets busy in 1 Corinthians chapter five, because now uh, Paul is, there we go. It's actually a short chapter, but Paul starts dealing with immorality now. Verses 1 through 13, you can read it for yourself. Paul goes through immorality. I don't have time to share it all with you. But Paul starts dealing with immorality like crazy. Because remember, now that he's kind of dealt with the factions and all the arguments that was happening, Chloe's that Chloe's service was telling him about, now the other letters that he received about immorality and, and weak brothers and weak sisters and, and all that kind of stuff, he's now about to address that part of the, of the, he's about to address those letters within the same context of this letter. So, Paul had heard reports of sexual immorality among them. And he reminded the church that incest was considered a reprobate act even by pagans. I want to argue this for a moment. This was part of their culture. This was part of their culture. Part of their culture was ancestral. It wasn't viewed the way it's viewed today, right? This is part of their culture. That was good. Reprobate act even by pagans. So the Corinthians, however, had apparently done nothing to deal with the detestable evil of, of incest within the context of their church. And so worse than that, they were proud of the situation. Oh, pause. So let me tell you what happened. What had happened was word got out that this young brother, right? had a father, you know, his father was married to this woman who wasn't his biological mama. However, she was legally his stepmother. So he decided, you know, I guess because she may have been significantly younger than his father and they may have been closer in age. Word on the street is he started sleeping with his stepmother, but she was a little bit younger than I think than the father. So because he was sleeping with the stepmother, it would look more age appropriate for him to be with her, unless she was some type of cougar. But uh, anyway, these two have a relationship. They're doing their thing, and they are public with their relationship. And everybody knows that his father's having a hard time trying to keep up with his son who took his woman. Now, it's weird because I don't know if that was his baby mama or if it was just, I don't know. But just know that this thing got really, really messy. Sound like something you would see on TV. And uh, it got really, really messy, and it got word got back to Paul. Paul said, "Lord Jesus, they don't understand. Incest is wrong too." Oh Jesus! All right, I thought y'all had that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. This is Corinth. Y'all don't know anything about that. Uh, let me help y'all understand something. You can't sleep with your camp folk. You know. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can't mess with your camp folk, man. You can't do that. And so. Um, they were proud of it. So Paul urged them, hey, y'all got to discipline that man involved. He says, hand him over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Which means y'all leave him alone. So this abandonment to Satan was to be accomplished not by a magical incarnation, but by expelling the man from the church. That's what they meant. They didn't mean let the devil uh, have him so he can be a divorce, but no, they meant kick him out the church, turn him over to this culture. Let him have the culture. He wanted, let him have that culture. When he get out there and realize this is crazy with what he already knows, he'll be back. And he was right. Expel him from the church. To expel him means turn him over to the devil's territory, this culture, this region. Severed from any connection with God's people, y'all leave them alone. Now, I ain't gonna lie, boy, if we started doing that today in church, it'd be a whole mess. 
You talking about church hurt? That is church hurt, I think. But is it church hurt or is it church responsibility? Pause. I really, really, really don't know. It's in your scripture. <laughs> oh, that's a... <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess God got to tell you to do it. <laughs> I don't know. But Paul ordered the, ordered the church not to even eat with, not to eat with that man, which means his family. That means that intimate association with a moral person, especially together at the Lord's table, will cause the unbelieving world to think that the church approves such ungodly living. In other words, if we don't deal with them because everybody saw it. Now, here's the thing. This was not a private issue. This was a public issue. This man was courting his stepmama in front of everybody. They were known in the city. Like, oh, there they go. There they go. There they go. Oh, they're over there too. I mean, it was a thing. And so Paul's like, yo, yo, his, I mean, I, I can, I could probably could, I could probably surmise that it's, it's possible that his father may have been a man's of means, may have been a family of, of, of network resource, et cetera, um, in order for people to react like that. Right. And so it might be safe to assume maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't think we can get in trouble here, but it might be safe to assume that because of the weight and the magnitude of what that family may have walked through and carried and who they were, it might've been best to uh, castigate them from the, from the congregation for a season so that people outside of the congregation could know that these Christians were different than the Corinth Zamos, the people of that culture. All right. That's chapter five. He deals heavily with that. Then we roll up our sleeves. Matter of fact, let's go back to chapter five and uh, verse six. Um, yeah. Let's look at verse. Well, we talked about that. Matter of fact, you go back and read chapter five, verse six through eight and how Paul talks about the leaven and all that kind of stuff. It makes sense. And as you know, the context, then Paul comes into chapter six. And this is when you start talking about your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit and all that kind of stuff. And we are God's temple. And the goal of this is about sexual relationships outside the context of marriage and the perversion of the divinely established marriage union is how Paul puts it or how uh, um, uh, theologians put it. So Paul chasing them for a facetious spirit, because what I'm thinking, and I don't know for a fact, but what I'm thinking is that this culture is hypersexual. So there's a whole lot of stuff happening with these new converts who have only been believing some between, I'm going to say, four, between one and four years of believing. If the church started or the, he began ministry in AD 49, wrote the letter in AD 55, I would say they probably were really solidly established, at least the infancy in AD 50 and or AD 51. And by the time we get to 80, 55, we're talking about a group of people who've only been in the way or as Christians for about at max, maybe three, maybe three and a half years. So they're babes in Christ. So there's a whole lot of activity going on. So Paul's like, hey, I got to write the letter to kind of give you some context. I know how y'all behave with pagan gods, but in chapter six, I'm going to walk through sexual, sexual appetites cravings, etc. I'm going to walk through this whole idea of the government. Paul is not saying Christians shouldn't be under the authority of secular governance governance here. But let's just what let's walk through it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. Let's go there. All right. Cuz the whole chapter is not about sex. I know we 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 get to that part cuz we we come down here to this part right here. But <laughs> But uh, and verse chapter seven, but it argues this here is argue, actually arguing about court cases and stuff. So Paul starts off talking about, hey man, look, there's a lot going on here. But let me argue this: he says, Does any of you, any, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and do and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that you will be uh, that that we will judge angels for how much more of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not among you one wise who will be able to decide between his brethren. 
but brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers, so on and so forth. He argues that, then he goes into fornicators, idolatrous, um, adulterous, effeminate, nor homosexuals, this is the New American Standard, nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, rivalers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, uh, but you were sanctified, uh, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of God. Now, Paul's ministry is a ministry of grace. Remember, this second half of his letter, this second half of his ministry journey, this letter, he's talking to Gentiles. He's talking to Gentiles. When he talks about the inheriting of the kingdom of God, that is not speaking of heaven. I know many people say that he's talking about you will not go to heaven if you... That is not what this context is actually talking about. It's talking about the rule of God, the basilia, the kingdom. The basilia which in, of God is, is the rule of God in the earth. You will not be able to walk in the kingdom if this was something that you were participating in. Let's just say he is talking about heaven, kingdom of heaven. He's saying you can't be this and get to heaven. But then he says something that's very key here in verse 11, because I don't want you to feel messed up. He says, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. He's talking to people who are presently in these situations. Pause. Paul tell him it was you, but Corinth is presently doing it. So who's the audience? Is the audience a bunch of people who used to be, or is the audience a bunch of people who are not? Is the audience people who are doing it presently? Who's the audience? He's telling us or telling them, and we get a chance to eavesdrop, that it was you. In other words, you were that, you were named that, but when you've been washed and been sanctified and justified, you're no longer that. Well, I just did that, but you're not that. Hey, that's a whole different revelation twist because now you've been given the kingdom of God. Yes, you did that. You are not that come out of that. You are not that. Come away from that. You are not that. Do you get it? Okay. He says, all things are lawful for me. Verse 12. And this is not talking about sex. This is, this is the whole total sum. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach and, uh, and, and stomach is for the food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for mortality. But for the Lord and, and the Lord is for the body. And he goes on to minister to that idea that we are his temple. I got to get to chapter seven. I have to. Can I keep can I keep going? I'll get to chapter seven and then I'll stop because I don't want to go too, too late. All right. He gets to chapter seven. Now, let me let me argue this. I might not get to seven because Paul says all things are lawful for me. And, you know, et cetera. And he doesn't. Uh, Again, these are what, <laughs> what theologians say are Paul's suggestions. Theologians say this. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, it's misunderstood about Paul's subject and change is not obvious. He goes from listing sins to talking about food. All right? And so we can know that Paul has changed subjects because he makes the same comment in relation to food in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Also, Paul would not say all things are lawful regarding sin after having just said the exact opposite in the last few verses. So when Paul wrote this letter, there would have been no punctuation or any kind of formatting as Greek writing was done. So the formatting in our Bibles comes from translators. This entire letter would have just been one long paragraph lasting pages. All right. So Paul makes this argument about food. He's shifting conversations uh, it can be a bit confusing. <laughs> and so a lot of this was Paul's suggestions as well. And I have to say that to you because it was, because it is verse chapter seven. Again, Paul goes into more recommendations because now Paul is setting things in order for marriages and what marriages should look like. And if you're single and if you're abstinent, again, he's talking to uh, addressing some of the concerns that came from other churches about the people's behavior and etc. They live in a country or a culture that worships Aphrodite. There's a whole lot of stuff happening in Corinth. There's a whole lot of stuff happening everywhere. All right. So Paul walks through this idea of marriage in chapter seven. He begins to pin ideas about marriage and suggestions. He offers suggestions 
uh, by marriage, just like he offers suggestions in other letters that talks about women should keep their head covered. These are suggestions. These are Paul's suggestions. You know, I wish you would walk around here with your head covered all the time. He, these are just <clears throat> suggestions to that culture, that time, that people, that hour, that moment. God didn't say it. Paul said, hey, I suggest this. All right. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Here we go. So Paul makes a lot of re recommendations in chapter seven to the church and some of what he says based on what God commands. However, Paul does make a lot of recommendations that are just that recommendations. Put recommendations in the chat. All right. So in most cases, in many cases, it is sinful to disregard. Uh, in some, however, it is sinful. To, is it sinful to disregard these suggestions? No. Rather, it would actually become more likely sinful to consider Paul's recommendations to be at the same level as God's commandments. That's the difference. Paul gave us suggestions, but you don't want to put Paul's suggestions and recommendations at the same measure as God's word. They are not the same. They are not the same. I'm going to say something very profound here, and it's the truth because it's the truth. Um, um, if, if we ask Paul what's your favorite scripture, Paul wouldn't quote his letters. Paul will quote the Torah. Paul may quote the books of the prophets. I don't know. But he wouldn't quote any of the New Testament. We call them the scriptures, and they are, but really, in fact, they are epistles. They are letters that we glean from Paul's information. And we take what Paul says and we line it up with the word of God. Paul quotes the word of God. In Romans, he quotes the Psalms. In Hebrews, he quotes the Psalms. He'll grab something from Isaiah. He'll do that because that's the scriptures, at least in the Jewish culture. And uh, it, for us in American culture, we call the whole, even Paul's letters and Peter's letters and the Gospels, we call that the scriptures. And it is scriptures for us. But in that time, they had the old covenant. All right? Um, I think that's about it because I don't have time to get to chapter eight as much as I want to. So I'm going to do a crash course on chapter eight next week. I want to open up for questions real quick. As the questions are rolling in, let me just say this next week, please make sure or this coming week you read, uh, first Corinthians nine through 16, first Corinthians nine through 16, just a chapter a day is fine. You can finish that out in no time, a chapter a day. 1 Corinthians 9 through 16, and next week will be our last dig in Corinthians. So we're going to rush through with a concise part of that. It's going to be fun. We'll get through it fast. All right, Bev Gondo says, as believers, we're not supposed to hang out with sinners. As believers, are we, I think that's a we, not supposed to hang out with sinners. When Paul said what he said about uh, hanging out with non-believers or hanging out with immoral, immoral people, he was not talking about the world. He actually clearly stated that in first Corinthians, he said, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about believers who will act like the world. That's what he was talking about at that time. He's talking about believers who hang out with the world. The Bible says Jesus was a friend to sinners. Now I think people take that and run with that, right? His life was a friend to sinners that Christ's mission was a friend to sinners, meaning he did sinners a favor like you and I by suffering what he's suffering, suffered, uh, dying the death that he died. Uh, that made him a friend to sinners, right? It's not that Jesus was like, oh, bring me to sinners, I'm going to share with them. That's not what that meant. But he was very kind to those who were lost. He saw them as the lost sheep. You know, Jesus' ministry was not to Gentiles. His ministry was to the Jews. And he was very clear and, and emphatic about the lost sheep of, of the house of Israel. So he saw them as lost sheep, sheep without a shepherd. So uh, the sinners were Jews people he was called to, and he saw, or should I say the broken, if you will, right? So I don't believe that as a Christian that God would want you to divorce all of your broken relationships or people that are broken in your life, right? If you have a, 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 you know, a good friend who is, is in whatever lifestyle that they're in and um, you don't subscribe to that lifestyle, you may change how you hang out with them. You may change how you address that world, <clears throat> but I do not believe that that means you should cut them completely off. You may not be able to go out to the to the club or or you know if whatever they're asking you to do is enticing you to do something that's going to be uh, counterproductive to what you're trying to do for Christ. 
then yeah, you should probably change the way you engage. I don't believe you always have to cut people off unless they completely disrespect and dishonor what you're doing. That's when I think it's time to pivot. Why do denominations put so much on attire, more specific women's attire? Good question. Um, I really believe, historically speaking, that um, initially, again, it's cultural, right? Like men and women wore dresses back in the day. So as a man, you had to have your uh, undergarments like uh, somewhat similar to a, a type of pants in the... Um, in the temp in the tab in the temple because uh in the tabernacle because you couldn't walk over uh certain areas and have your um lower extremities be seen so you had to have that covered right um it, otherwise it would desecrate it would desecrate the altar so um i think when it comes to women's clothing i think tr the traditions of men i think depend depending upon your denominational bend as well but we're talking it, let me just let me put it this way I can't speak for the Middle Eastern church because I, 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 I've never been, but I can speak for the American church proper um, to some degree. Depending upon your denomination, you have to understand that culture or American culture was infused into our Christian doctrine, our biblical worldview or our biblical national view. Uh, it definitely has a, a Western cultural lean in it, right? So now we, we wear pretty much, you know, we're very relaxed, et cetera. Uh, but that's because culture has gotten that way as well, right? So it's more acceptable than it was prior to. Even your jobs would say, man, it's casual. Before, you used to have to wear you know, a certain type of uniform. Uh, business casual is how you dressed every day. I remember when men had to go to you know work, unless they worked in the, um, with their hands or something like that, uh, they were um, in a suit and tie. That's how it was, especially in the 50s, 40s and 50s. Men wore, you know, uh, you know, the, the dress shirts with the short sleeves and a tie, you know, whatever. That was the look, though. Um, a, a certain casual um, business, casual look. Anyway, so I think the reason why churches oftentimes really pick on women's attire is there is an appropriateness, I think, for ministry. But then there's also uh, where we're overreaching and over, overbearing. Right. And I think that is because of some of the dogmatic or the dogmas that come from um, traditions of men, customs of culture, and then also uh, denominational preferences, right? Um, again, it's not sin if you don't do it. It's only sin if you know that's their culture and you rebel against it or revolt against it for the purposes of saying you're not going to tell me. That speaks to something much bigger. My old thought has always been find a church that best suits um your culture and what you feel, uh, how you feel, uh, some of your convictions about attire. Now, I do believe men and women have to be careful with how we dress. Um, you want to make sure you're not a stumbling block, right? Because I think you could teach you could teach soberly about stumbling blocks without teaching control. You know, that's my thought. <clears throat> uh, Bonnie Stevenson says, when putting the canons together, why were so many letters left out? That's a good question. Um, um, you know, during the uh, Nicene Council, when they came together to put these things together, these particular books or what we consider books, I think they the goal was to, if I'm not mistaken, the goal was to craft it in such a way that told the story of the gospel. So what was going to bring everybody to Jesus? So if you're looking at the gospel according to St. Thomas, it didn't really bring you to to jesus they didn't really speak about what he did you talking about the gospel according to mary i think these are other books that are written much later that wasn't going to be beneficial to bringing you to jesus to 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 narrating the life or uh showing us the life of jesus or the life in christ after christ you know so i don't think a lot of those books really told that the book of enoch's not going to speak to uh the storyline of jesus right it's not going to give you bring you to a place of of uh seeing God or Yahweh being in introduced to the world and then bringing us to Christ. Maccabees does not bring you to Christ. It doesn't even point to Christ. Enoch doesn't point to Christ, right? Edris doesn't point uh, to Christ. None of the books in the ap apocryphal really point to Jesus. They're there, but they don't really point to Jesus. Uh, you know, So these books were hand uh, handpicked because these particular books and epistles 
pointed us to Jesus. It told the story of the gospel. I think that's why God allowed these men at the Nicene Creed, a Nicene Council, rather, I'm sorry, to uh, to put these together. Um, let's see. I hope I answered that right. I got one more question. Um, last one. How do you navigate relationships at work when you are the only believer and they constantly believe your belittle your beliefs, even though you are trying to be positive about it? First of all, Beth, let me just say this to you real quick. Thank you for even sharing your your faith, right? At the at the workplace, man. Kudos to you. God bless you. Matter of fact, let me clap it up for you. <laughs> kudos to you. A lot of people do not share their faith anymore, but I'm I I understand. And you know what? The Bible is clear. Jesus said, "Man, shake the dust off your feet." as a testimony against them. That does not mean you got to be mean or rude. If they don't want to hear it, don't share it. Don't share it. You just stay over there and be positive and work in another field, work with another group, work in another area. Uh, not your job, but I mean who you're, who you're trying to reach. Work on somebody else. Look at the one who's the most open, right? And that's the one you work with. That's the one you are there for. You don't have to be pushy about it every day. Your life is going to speak more than what you say. And, uh, and how kind you are and, you know, how prayerful you are concerning them. And then start praying for those that are lost, those who dissed it, those who make fun. Start praying that God will convict their hearts. Guys, I love y'all and I appreciate the time, man. Let's clap it up again, everybody. <laughs> Thank y'all for being part of the dig part two, man. I'm excited about it. I know you are too. I love y'all so very much. And again, We'll have a concise version of my notes at the end of this dig. So next week will be the last one. I love y'all so very much, and I'll see you next week. Peace, y'all.